How many bluebells are there in the wood? There are millions. How do you count them? Well, one way is to take one square metre, count those carefully, and then multiply them by the square meterage of the wood. It would work if the sample square metre we take is an accurate representation of the meterage of the wood. Choosing a representative sample is a problem for anyone collecting data. For James Thompson, studying the effects of climate change on the pollination of glacier lilies, it's very important. This plant basically needs what we call outcrossing. It needs to, to mate with another plant, and that involves pollen being moved by insects. Bees that are successful at pollinating these rather large flowers are large animals. Specifically, they're the queens of bumblebees. And bumblebees have a lifestyle where the queen is the only animal that lives through the winter. So when spring comes, a bumblebee queen burrows up from the soil, and it's her responsibility to start a successful nest. She collects pollen and nectar. She lays eggs on a mass of that. She uh, produces offspring. And eventually, then, the offspring become worker bees who take over, and, and the queen stops foraging. If the flowers are blooming too early, then the bees aren't, aren't even emerged. So these guys don't have any reproduction by seed if pollinators are out of the system. In order to track the rate of pollination over many years, he has to choose a sample of flowers that reflects the distribution of flowers in the tundra. The classiest statistical way to draw a random sample of glacier lilies would be to go and enumerate each glacier lily in the, in the field here, uh, give each one an individual code, and then use a computer and a random numbers generator to pick a random set of those and go do them. I can't do that they'd be out of bloom before I'd done it. So I need to take a sample that's going to be representative. I try to spread each of my selections over a large enough spatial area that I won't be getting strange results just because something weird happened right here or some deer came and started grazing and took all my plants. So I have to pay attention to getting representative plants. I'd say that's the most important thing. So in this film, we look at sampling and accuracy. How big a sample do we need to be able to make conclusions within some known margin of error? This is important whether you're studying wastewater, climate change, or politics. In an earlier film, we followed Caroline Wooldrich as she campaigned for a seat on the Basingstoke County Council. The Labour Party here in Brighton Hill in Basingstoke was trying to decide whether they might be able to win a place on the council that's tended to be Liberal Democrat. How can they know if they have a chance to win? Should they invest extra time and energy if they have a chance? Brighton Hill is interesting because it's been clearly Liberal Democrat, um, but Carolyn feels she's got a genuine chance this time. Do you think that's realistic? I think it is. I think it would be amazing if she achieves it, but she's worked very hard over very over this period and I think that's translating into vote. Yeah. It's a big swing to win it. I mean, it's you need a big, a big swing. swing. What is the thing you said? You're, you're talking you're talking easily plus twenty five percent to win yeah. that seat. I mean that's and that's out there. I mean that's right on the edge of probability. Yes. But at the same time the feedback on the doorstep is, is possible. Encouraged by positive responses on the doorstep and national opinion polls that indicated a swing away from the Liberal Democrats Labour was mobilised in Basingstoke to work hard to take the seat. One of the reasons why I think we stand a chance this time because people are just welcoming us back. So, and it has been swinging our way, certainly. The last, especially the last few nights, it's been really swinging our way. So. One important way to influence the outcome is by using tellers. Each party keeps lists of known supporters and tellers keep track of who's voted and who hasn't. This is called knocking up, right? And what we have to do now is we have a list here of these are all people who, when they've been canvassed but on the telephone, they've pledged that they're going to vote Labour, right? And we cross the names off as the Labour votes come in, which we can tell from the polling number, right? So what we have here is a list of people who haven't yet voted. So what we're doing late in the afternoon, we're actually going out and knocking on the door and saying, excuse me, we're from the local Labour Party, 
we have recorded here that someone's promised to vote Labour and you haven't voted yet. Would you like to get out and vote? Great. Right. Okay. Hello there, I'm from the local Labour Party. Have you voted oh, yet? Yes, I have. Have you been out there and Polls voted? are a very important part of the democratic process and politicians watch them very closely, even if they deny it in public. Number one, it depends on who they're talking to. If they're talking to the television or to a public audience, they don't believe in opinion polls. They believe in that. The second is that if they're talking in private, they believe them beyond all recognition. And the third one, if they change their policies, I'm delighted because it says they're listening to public opinion. And if they're not there to represent the public, what are they doing in Parliament? One widely used scheme, including in political polling, is stratified random sampling, where the population is divided into a number of non-overlapping subpopulations called strata, and then a random sample is taken out of each stratum. The basis of the stratification might be age, income, residence, this increases the reliability of the sample, making it more representative of the population while saving some costs. Samples from different strata can be different in size, non-proportional if they need to reflect the different size or significance of the strata. For example, if the proportion of population over 60 is larger, or if a larger proportion of this age votes, the pollsters might then want to interview more of those and less of, say, the 18 to 25 group. Another form of stratified sampling is quota sampling, where personal judgment plays a significant role in the selection process. Such samples we call judgment or non-probability samples. If we use non-probability sampling, we can't use quite the same formula that we use if we have probability sampling. Do we hereby give notice that the number of votes recorded for each candidate at the said election is as follows. Caroline won the election. Let's look at what happened. We have two tables of data here. The first is a national opinion poll taken very close to the local elections. The second is the result in Brighton Hill in Basingstoke. As you can see, the results are somewhat different. What are the main reasons? First, Brighton Hill is not representative of the national picture. Second, people may have changed their minds between being polled and voting. Third, some of those who said they'd support a particular party may not have wanted to support a particular local candidate or vice versa. Finally, people may not have bothered to vote at all, even though they said they would. But are the opinion polls themselves reliable? The polls conducted by the local politicians have got an element of bias in it because people are inclined to say whatever the local interviewer wants to hear. Do you worry that um, uh, people will say anything uh, to please the interviewer? Oh, well, yes, that does happen. Uh, yes, I mean, when the Tory per person knocks on the door, they'll say they're going to vote Tory. When the Labour person knocks on the door, they say they're going to etc. But yes, at the same time, they know at the end of the day, people might be telling them rubbish. So you know there's an element of unreliability. Obviously, yes, yeah. there will be, yeah. yes. But is there a problem about the professional pollsters? Even there, there may be an interview effect where people listen to the tone of voice of the interviewer and respond still to what they think the interviewer wants to hear. So there are two issues here. One is the reliability of the sample accurately reflecting opinion. Two, is the value of the poll as a forecasting tool good when voting intentions can change quickly? Thinking about that first issue, are they accurate? Just how big a sample do you need to get a useful estimate of the way people are thinking about voting? Our understanding of statistics will give us an insight into this. Now here's the sampling problem we want to solve. Assuming we've got, say, 1,569 electors and 20% are known to be Labour Party supporters, how many people would we have to sample to be confident 
we've got a suitably representative cross-section of voting opinion. There's a formula that we can use to find the number of voters we need to ask. The size of the sample we'll call n, and n must satisfy the equation z sub naught times the square root of pq divided by n equals e, where p is the proportion favouring a particular party, in our case the Labour Party, q is the rest of our population, it might be just the Conservatives or the Conservatives, Liberal Democrats and others, z sub naught is the confidence limit and e is the maximum error that's acceptable. Notice that, of course, P plus Q will equal 1, but P times Q won't. Now, our unknown is N, so to find N we'll need to rearrange our equation with N on the left-hand side. Doing this gives us that N equals Z sub naught squared times PQ divided by E squared. Now here we'll choose that Z sub naught be 1.96. We need to be within 1.96 standard deviations of the mean to give us 95% confidence in our answer. P is 0.2 so Q is 0.8 and we'll choose E to be 0.01 because we want to be within 1% with a 95% certainty. So using these values N equals 1.96 squared times 0.16 divided by 0.0 naught 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 one which gives us naught point oh six one four six five six over naught point naught 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 one which equals six hundred and fourteen point six five now we can't interview point six five of a person so the minimum we need to interview is six hundred and fifteen people that's the size of the sample will need. And what difference would it have made if the electorate had been, say, 5,000 people? And the answer, perhaps surprisingly, is no difference at all. For large numbers, the sample size is independent of the size of the whole population. What difference would it have made if, say, 30% rather than 20% had been Labour Party supporters? The answer is quite a bit. You might rework the formula to discover the necessary number now. Wastewater treatment, climate change research, and elections seem unrelated, but they do have statistical similarities. Often we rely on statistics to make inferences about larger systems. We can't know what each voter is thinking, we can't judge climate change by looking at one flower. We can't judge the effectiveness of wastewater treatment with just one sample. We need to understand the use of statistical techniques if we are to arrive at meaningful answers within some known margin of error.